Um, and and, and to, to, to urge a public to forget the kind of social earnestness of New Deal politics, the, the equality, that the, 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 the earnestness of equality, and to relax and move toward a liberty of, of personal fulfillment. And to some extent, you don't pick up on this theme, although I bet you will in your book, uh, Nancy, they were aided by a whole raft of social changes in American life. I mean, I, I think of the contrast between the 18th century and uh, Patrick Henry, who says, give me liberty or give me death, and uh, Burger King that says, have it your way. <laughs> Or McDonald's, it says, you deserve a break today, or a whole raft of invitations to self-fulfillment. And that, as a consumerist version of liberty, really then coincides with the notion that we not only should have it our way with soft drinks and burgers, but should have it our way with schools. Why shouldn't you be able to pick your child's school in the same way you pick your family car or whatever? So they were partly, as it seems to me, lifted by that. The limits, of course, what you've done in this little paper is you really have not showed how the transfer of the thoughts occurred. But what you do come back to, and here's where my two comments come in, or how can this have somehow appealed to African Americans who were so vilified? And, and one of the suggestions is, uh, gosh, you made a conscious play for them, but the, another suggestion is that, to some extent, uh, African Americans have been excluded from many of the New Deal programs, or at least uh, uh, put to the edge, and, and that came back to, 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 uh, to, to haunt things. Well, I, that's probably true, uh, but there's another factor that seems to be crucially important, particularly as it respects schools. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, so it's got to be about courts. You know, if there's a factor that's important, it's a legal factor. Um, the Supreme Court um, had as I said, denied in Griffin uh, vouchers and, 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 and tax relief. It, in 1968, did something even more uh, radical in a sense. Uh, in, the, in the Green case, it looked at freedom of choice, in which you said, you may choose where your child goes to school in this small New Kent County, and said, freedom of choice will not work because it doesn't yield racially integrated results. And by that time, the court was so, I think, invested in the project of Brown that it says, unless there are racially integrated results where there are no discernible white schools or black schools, to use their language, but just schools, we will order integration even if there had been full choice among everyone. So, so, so that project went forward after Green and Swan, of course, the Charlotte case. And throughout the South, there was widespread desegregation and, and, and a, a pretty radically and effectively accomplished for a time being. But as desegregation moved north, a very different landscape occurred. Because northern school districts are not countywide, for the most part, like southern school districts had been. In the Detroit area, for example, there are 67 separate school districts within the metropolitan setting. And so the question in a place like Detroit, which came to a head in the Supreme Court in 1974, is may a federal judge who has found that there was intentional discrimination in the schools order the movement of children across those uh, school district lines in order to desegregate those schools. The parents who lived in the suburbs worked in the cities. They went down to the cities to go to all the, the stores and the, uh, uh, the, the, the sports arenas, et cetera. Surely their children could move back and forth. The answer to the court by a five to four vote, as you know, in, in the Milton case was no, they may not. And that locked those northern, particularly northeastern and north central school districts uh, out of effective racial desegregation. And so you've got findings in many of these cases of intentional segregation in the past. What's the remedy? Well, the remedy is not integration. It can't be, says the Supreme Court, five to four, with a long lament by, by uh, Thurgood Marshall, who saw what uh, this would mean. There was actually a separate case that came back to court, Millikan II, in which the court said, well, maybe you can order some additional dollars thrown into Detroit to make up for the fact that those children will not be racially integrated, and so the so-called Millikan II remedies went forward, never terribly effective. Well, the second thing that happened uh, then uh, was there was an attempt to litigate school finance and say, surely what we can do then is insist that every school district and the children within it should have equal resources for education, irrespective of race. The court said no to that in the Rodriguez case in 1973. 
So now we have a Supreme Court that has said you may not move children across school district lines in the north central states, and you don't really have to equalize the dollars there. Well, well what, what whites in the suburbs quickly realized is that because they still had uh, political majorities in most of those states, they were able to structure the financing systems for the cities in such a way that many of those urban school districts were radically underfunded. Gary Orfield tells this story with Carol Askenazi in the book called The Closing Door about Atlanta, which saw exactly that happen. Uh, Andrew Young and other folk took control of the city, but guess what? The city had so few state resources that it found itself unable to operate uh, adequate schools. Um, so, so at that point, it seems to me, Nancy, uh, to close the loop with federal constitutional claims impotent, with school finance litigation largely impotent as well, conservatives turn to somebody like Howard uh, Fuller and say, what do you want, a quarter a loaf or none at all? We can just walk away. And a serious African-American reformer with a question much like the one that Booker T. Washington got, you know, in his era uh, after the, the, the segregation movement started, may well have said, I see the faces of those children, I see that need, it is half a loaf, it is quarter a loaf, I don't have any other bread at all uh, without that. And, and, and to that extent, I think, uh, I would sort of say that the Supreme Court, both in the 1890s in, in, in the Plessy era and the 1990s and, 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 and the 1970s first and the 1990s later, uh, basically created the climate in which this kind of project could, could move forward. Um, the second comment I would make is that this is such an important paper, for, at least for me, for, for a second uh, reason. And that is the uh, long civil rights movement history will have to take seriously the, the real nature of the struggle waged on both sides and deeply. I guess I've always been drawn to the naive sort of triumphalist notion that uh, African Americans and their white allies had right on their side and came and brought uh, these notions of equality and there was irrational and, and uh, incoherent and reactionary and stupid resistance by whites <laughs> and that was simply overcome and the problem is that it never ends and everything lived happily, everyone lived happily ever after, but my friends and I would sit around and say, we don't want dominated public schools because of their resistance to the infusion of Protestant rhetoric. And they needed or thought they needed uh, you know, help with paying for their children's parochial schools. So there's an ally. And then you draw allies from other courses. And finally, in the great irony, you draw allies from the African Americans themselves, who see they have no other choice. So to that extent, the long civil rights movement really does have a link to it, because it's, it's not over in one act, or two acts, or three acts, because there is such sort of careful political economic uh, uh, effort going on. I have other things I could say, but I think, if I got a minute or two left? I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tell you that.